If you have your Bibles, you'll be turning the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 3, Revelation chapter 3, and it's good to have uh, Brother Eric, I was getting a little concerned about him, you know, people who are consistent, uh, and, you know, you, the tendency of the flesh is just going to think the worst, so I'm glad everything is good. Revelation chapter 3, and we're going to begin reading in verse 7. Revelation chapter 3, uh, beginning in verse 7. The Bible says, And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, write these things, say, saith he that is holy, and he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth, and no man shutteth, and shutteth, and no man openeth. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews, and are not, but to lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know I have loved thee. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Yeah. Behold, I come quickly, that, fa that, that fast which... Behold, I come quickly, hold that fast which thou hast, that no man may take thy crown. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of God, and he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him, and I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. He that have an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Lord, we thank you and praise you for your word. Let us never forget to be thankful that we have something that many nations don't have. God, we pray that you would speak through your word this morning to the hearers. God, help us to recognize uh, the glory and the responsibilities for being in one of your churches, Lord. And we pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Now, uh, fairly familiar verses of Scripture, although I can say that I've heard more preached from the church at Laodicea than I have heard preached from the church at Philadelphia. Now, if you know your Bible, Philadelphia is the only church that received no criticism. They are the only church that he says you could do this better. He's the only church that, that he never said you left your first love. He never said that you look like a, that you compromised, nothing like that. He never accused them of having a woman pastor. All he says is good things. Now, I think it would be, it would be noteworthy then what set Philadelphia apart. What made them different? What caused them to be a different church than all the other, others that are mentioned in, in the uh, first part of the Revelation. And I believe if we study the Word of God, we can get to it. And better than that, with the help of the Almighty, we can mimic it. We can be better than the average church, than, than the routine church. And no doubt that's what we ought to uh, strive for. First of all, I think one of the missing elements in the Lord's churches in the modern day, uh, uh, everybody, does anybody know what Philadelphia means? We have a Philadelphia here in the United States. It's where our Constitution was signed off on. Uh, and it is known, although I'd, I'd have to disagree, it is known as the city of brotherly love. Yeah. And Philadelphia simply means that, love. Uh, so I think a noteworthy church then should be noted by love. If we're going to be successful and we're going to be a church that, uh, that spreads the gospel as we ought, then we ought to
to be known by love. Now, uh, that sometimes is a very difficult thing in the day which we live, and we definitely have to somewhere walk the balance between compromise and love. But you can love the souls of men without being involved in what they're doing. You can love the individual enough to give them the gospel then, uh, and, and still not approve of Amen. what they're doing. Amen. Love is critical to a church. You know why churches go out? Uh, just like Laodicea, they don't even have a good, a good view of themselves. What did Laodicea think about themselves? They thought things were going great. We have much. We have need of nothing. Yeah. Uh, often reminds me when we go, uh, uh, when the Lord, uh, uh, and he may have been in Jeremiah, I can't remember, uh, but one place in Scripture it talks about the man who looks into the looking glass, but he doesn't address the problem on his face and walks away just like he was when he started. Uh, that's a lot of the modern day churches. They, they don't address the issues. They don't address compassion. Uh, they don't teach even the need of compassion. And so we find that the first hallmark of a good church is a church that loves. A church that loves one another, that, that loves the Lord, that loves people out there that need the gospel even today. Uh, a church that loves is a church that will last. But a church that could care less, have no compassion on others, have, have no compassion of where the Lord has placed them very quickly, they will cease to exist. And so we see the first hallmark of this church, even in their name, is love. The, to the angel or the pastor or maybe the angelic being of the church in Philadelphia, right. Now, I want you to see that when the Lord gives you something, you better go with it. If the Lord uh, wants you to teach something, teach it. If he wants you to call on the phone and bid someone good morning, you better do it. Now, you think about the angel of the church at Philadelphia and, and the scathing message they received. Do you think that that angel wanted to deliver that? And I would say probably not. It wasn't good news. It, it, it wasn't a pat on the back. It, it, wasn't, it wasn't encouraging at all. There's things that we're going to have to be taken care of or they would lose their candle. And that's another thing I'll point out to the church of Philadelphia. You see, their candle wasn't threatened. All other six of the, those six other churches, their candle was at jeopardy. But this one wasn't. So it set them apart. They, they, they loved people and it showed. They had concern for never dying souls and it, it illuminated from them. So the church at Philadelphia, it wasn't bad news, but there were going to be challenges. When the pastor or the preacher or the angelic being conveyed these things, it was encouraging news, but at the very same time, there was, there was, there was some things coming that the church had to be prepared for. The rest of that verse says, These things saith he that is holy and he that is true. Now, I want you to see two descriptors really out of the Lord Jesus Christ uh, verifies that the message is what's needful. You know what's needful today is just the gospel. Uh, you, you can't find people out here, and, and I've been wanting to maybe get one of these little booths where they, I, I saw where a, fr a friend of mine, Tammy Trawick, was selling baked goods out and down here behind the courthouse. It's like a place to sell produce and stuff on Saturday. Set up a little booth and just give out our tracts and, 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 and try to be an encouragement to the people and just simple tracts that tell of the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, they can't start out on, on, on a steak. They'll choke to death. But we find the two things about this church, the, the one, uh, that, the G, that Jesus is holy and true. Now, holy sometimes may be a little bit easier for to see. Uh, that's an attribute of the, of the most holy God, uh, usually. 
He's always right. He's always good. He's always kind. He's always sinless. He is holy. And then the other piece is this. He's true. Whatever God, Jesus says, it's true. Amen. I mean, you, you can't depend on what people say, but you can depend on the Word of God. It's true. It is exactly as it says it is. It's true. Now, uh, the, the church here at Philadelphia is going to get uh, wonderful good news and, and good braves from the Lord, but at the same time, there are things coming that may not seem that good, that may seem threatening, that maybe seems difficult to face, but I want you to know it's true. Everything is not going to be wonderful, but that don't make it that it's not true. What, what God's people need today is truth. Somebody to tell them the truth. Someone to teach them this word. That is the need. So this message that Philadelphia, the church of love, receives is true because it's handed by God. He that hath the key of David. Now, I don't know Philadelphia. I mean, that is a Greek word, so I'm assuming it was a Greek city, but I don't know. I don't think it was a Hebrew city. But he makes a reference to the Old Testament. He says he has the key of David. Now, we're fixing to see, because a lot of people would get on this boat, these new modern Jews, I use that loosely, Messianic <laughs> Jews, uh, they would jump on the key of David. But listen, I want you to see the key of David has nothing to do with the law. The key of David is the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> How do we have a, on what merit do we have bidding unto the great God Jehovah? It's the, it's the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's our key. <laughs> That, that's the only way we have access. That's the only we, way we gain truth is through the person of Christ. And so the key of David is Christ himself. And apparently this church relished in that truth. They love that truth. Uh, and so we see that he is uh, the, he begins to teach them uh, concerning this point. Then notice he says, He, meaning the Lord God, that openeth and no man shutteth. Now, that's a glorious and wonderful thing. Um, apparently, this church had a ministry and the Lord opened the door and there was no effort of man whatsoever that was going to shut it. Isn't that a wonderful thing? Uh, you know, a lot of times uh, we'll, we'll get the idea, well, the devil just closed that door. Or maybe even the Lord just closed that door. That's fine if that's how it happened. But I want you to see this door was open and it wasn't going to be shut. What an opportunity of ministry. What, a, what an opportunity to get the gospel out and speak of the goodness of Christ to, to others. The door was ensured to be open. We don't get that a lot today. Uh, you know, uh, the older I get, the more I see this. Take your opportunities. Listen, while you're young, while you have the ability to do it, keep going through the open door. Keep pressing forward. Keep going. That was what was noteworthy about this church. And then notice the flip side. And shutteth, and no man openeth. So the only thing that I can think of and this would be, you're not going to mess up. You can't force open a door that God has shut. So why are you tiptoeing around? Right? Are you going to get out of line? Well, if God shut it, you're not going to get in. So how could you possibly do that? Just spread the gospel. Just tell people the goodness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah, if, you, if you don't know one verse of Scripture, tell him... Tell them what he has done for you. The door's open. The, door, the door's not going to be oppressed. 
What is the door for New Testament Baptist Church? Where is the opening? What are we supposed to go through? What are you supposed to go through? Are you, are you committing everything that you can to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ? And that's exactly what we're to do. The door's not going to shut on you. Verse 8, the Lord Jesus says this to every one of the churches. I know thy works. Now, the next thing you'll see in that sentence is a colon. And this is one of the few things I remember about English class. Where a colon is at, it could actually stand as two separate sentences. They have full thoughts with, on both sides of the colon. And so, just the fact, the, the very humbling fact, I know thy works. Now, certainly he knows mine. He knows what I'm about. He knows what makes me tick. He knows, he knows what drives me on a regular day. But whom is he really addressing? He's not addressing uh, an individual. He's addressing the church at Philadelphia. So, in addition to your own ministry, there's collective ministry here called the church, and he knows about it. He knows what New Testament is doing, and he knows what New Testament is not doing. And he knows our works. And, and so we see as, as uh, John is writing under the inspiration of the Lord Jesus Christ, the church of Philadelphia have the, have the full understanding that God understands, that God knows what's going on in the group. Behold, I set before thee an open door. Again, very, very, very specific, very real. And you can't complain about it. You can't say it's not there. Toad twice, you have an open door. Use it. Ever thought about the strangety of doing work for the Lord and so many few people are interested in it. But I guarantee you this, if you ran, if you yelled fire, you'd see them behind the door. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? That, that, that's the differences in the modern day. And so he says, I've opened this door for you, church, at Philadelphia. The church of love, the church that loves me and, and, and loves the gospel. Behold, I have set before thee an open door that no man could shut. For why did they do it? Why did God do this for them? For thou hast a little strength. <laughs> you know, it's an amazing thing how God works with little, little tiny things. If you just have faith as the grain of mustard seed. Yeah. Ever planted any grass? I, I plant, and when, especially when me and Donna first moved out on the place, that the big hill in the front, and we 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 sow grass seed in the snow. And uh, it was uh, they were just so tiny and, and so small. You think what could this possibly do? Well, if you have faith, it can do a whole lot. Uh, I'm still mowing that stuff 30 years later. So, what is your faith about? Who do you place it in? And he says, I, I, I've created this open door because I've seen you use other things to spread the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. I have seen you use things before to magnify thy name. You have a little, you have a little, and so I give it to you. You, you, you. You've done well. You have a little bit of ability. You have a little strength. Use it. Uh, you're the old saying, when it, as you're getting older, you use it or lose it. That's a real thing, you know what? You just got to use it. Yeah, make your mind sharp. Go to doors. Preach. Show them the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Be real. Most important thing you could ever do is be real. Uh, if somebody asks you something concerning the Word of God, 
you don't know it, say, I don't know, but I'll find out for you. We, we need to be that. Just use what little you have. Use the little strength that God... See, the devil dearly loves to take strength away. And who knows to all these other seven churches, even the church in Ephesus, and that was the one where Timothy pastored, even the church there, he says, you've left your first love. And they had all these ministries going and did not realize they had left their, left their first love. He says... Use that little bit of strength. You say, well, Brother Larry, I don't have any. Well, make your calling and election sure. Because I don't believe that he saves anybody without giving them some amount of strength to use for his own glory. Not an attribute that put them into this position. And thou hast kept my Word. Mm -hmm. God, God's kept my word. You know, I, I'm, I see a lot of Bible stuff on Facebook. And I, I'm sad to say, as things go along, uh, most of them are becoming NIV. That's not, that is not a work compiled by the Almighty. But you know what? It gains people. It's not much offensive stuff in, a, in, a, in an NIV Bible. It, it, you know, you, you, can, you can draw a big crowd. But we must keep the Word. You want an effective church, no matter the size, keep the Word. Don't compromise on that book in front of you. Everybody, you know, the New King James Version. You know what? Even that one has 1,600 differences than ours. <laughs> Keep the word. The English-speaking people, this is our Bible. Keep it. This church was, was, was validated, was encouraged, was, was complimented just because they kept the word. And, and huh, that's what they were to use when they went out through the door. That's what they were to use in this door that was open and no man could shut. <laughs> so they had a little strength, they kept the word, and has not denied my name. Now I want you to uh, look at that. You know what? We're not Messianic Jews. We're Christians. Don't deny his name. Uh, we're not the lost tribe of Israel. We're Christians. Don't deny his name. Don't be afraid to use the name Jesus. <laughs> they were called Christians first at Antioch because they defended the faith. It, it was a derogatory term. It was an insulting term. You act just like Jesus. It, it was meant to cut you down. That's where we need to be. Don't, don't deny the name of Jesus. Don't, you know... Uh, there's nothing wrong with the name, the great God, Jehovah. It's an elegant, wonderful name. There's nothing now wrong with saying Yahweh, which is a Hebrew rendering of that. But listen, we are the people of Jesus. We're not Jews. In no shape or form. And so we find that this church, the one that was, the one that was complimented, the one that was being affected, held vastly to the name of Jesus. Verse 9, Behold, I will make them, meaning these individuals that claim this Jewishness, Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not. Now we won't get in too deeply in this modern messianic Jew day movement, but let me just say this. How are you a Jew? You have to be born a Jew, right? It's your genetic gene. It's passing it from one generation to the next, or you have to submit yourself to the law and be re uh, recircumcised. Now, in all this messianic Jew mess, is any of them doing that? And I dare say no. I would say absolutely not. 
See, that's going to bring their own demise one day, is it not? It's going to be the very thing that they defend and the very thing they revel in. It is what's going to bring them down. And so we should not be embarrassed and we should not be uh, cowered down by just preaching Christ and Him crucified. That, that's what these people were doing. They, they were, they, they were complimenting, complimented on the fact that they didn't include, include all these others. Who will say they are Jews and are not, but do lie? Behold, I make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee. Now, I want you to see the, the end place of these individuals is going to be that they'll say we're right. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine the day when, when all these small, the Pope himself will have to say, no, I was completely deceived. They're right. It's going to happen. From the Pope right down to Charles Tass Russell, it's a reality that's coming. For those who hold faith, for those who don't compromise, for those that, that, that stick it out when the sticking gets difficult, those are the individuals that will be among this number. Then in verse 10, the Bible says, Because thou hast kept the word of my patience. A hallmark of another good church, this church that had done so well, Kept my word with patience. How patient of a person are you? We we live in an instantaneous world where patience has been forgotten. I, I know this is an, after preparing for my sermon this morning, I went to the kitchen to get me something to drink, and there was two sodas there, and one of them was ready to go. A little. 18 ounces like you get from Walmart and then the other one was a two liter. You know which one I went with? I went with the, the 20 out of the 18 ounces. You know why? I didn't have to pour it. I didn't have to put ice in it. All I had to do is grab and go. That's the world that we live in, is it not? Serving Christ is not like that. Serving Christ takes patience. Being faithful takes a lot and lot of patience. And, and the devil will swim in, oh Lord, did I make the wrong decision? Should I be somewhere else? Should I do this? Should I do that? Uh, what, what, what a mess is this thing's in? No, no, be patient. See, I bet there were people at the Church of Philadelphia that wanted to say, well, you know what, forget it. I'm done. And you know what? I'd even go further and say some did leave. They ran out of patience. You ever whip your children out of frustration more so than discipline? I have. It's, it's nothing to brag about, but I have. It's much better to be patient. Much better. Now, if they do something, you get them. But our patience and their behavior doesn't have anything to do with each other, does it? Be patient. It's going to take time. Uh, that, that, that's the hallmark. When, when everybody else is saying, you know what? Uh, I'm going to go in this direction. You go in this direction. You get in this one. And that will be, that will be, uh, that will be a great comfort to you. Notice the promise if we do this. Verse 10, the second part. I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Again, again I believe another indication of a, a, a pre-tribulation catching away or rapture. He says, if you do this, you're not going to have to go through it. 
If you do this, if you be faithful, if you stand true, if you continue to love, if you can be faithful to the Word of God, you love people that don't love you, if you'll just continue with that, you'll have a great relief. You'll, you'll, have, you'll enjoy something others don't. And that's when really, literally all hell breaks loose on this earth. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep you from that. And that's a, that's a rich, rich promise. And so, the church of Philadelphia, if they remained faithful, had something to look forward to. Verse 11. Behold, I come quickly. How many times you've heard that? How many times have you read it? I mean, from the time that I was AJ's size and probably before, I've seen people stand behind pulpits all over this county and preach the very same verse and say, he's coming, he's coming, the time is near, get ready, he's coming. And you know what? They were right and I'm right too. He's coming. Behold, I come quickly. That means get your house in order. Man, that's what he told the king, was it not? <laughs> Set thine house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. That's what, that's, what's, that's what I come quickly is about. The reality that the Lord Jesus Christ is very near at hand. This church held that. And we need to, too. Mm -hmm. You know what? If you think you have plenty of time, the impulse is to go back to sleep. When I woke up this morning in our bedroom, it's the morning light, it's hot all day, and then finally the sun goes up outside the house. But I woke up about 5.30, and the sun was done in my eyes, and couldn't go back to sleep. But if it had been a cloudy day, it had been my inclination to cover up my head and just conk out for a little while more, right? But he's coming quickly. Don't do that. He's coming quickly, church. Don't give up. Don't quit. He's coming quickly. And you know what? Uh, if my life ceases and I'm pushing out daisies over here, he's still come quickly. No man knoweth the day nor the hour. Behold, I come quickly. Hold fast that which thou hast. Hold fast. You're not getting mine. Hold fast. Remember, years ago, it's one of the time when my seizures were so frequent I couldn't drive. And me and Betsy, one of the nurses I used to work with, we went to do a visit together. Because of the venipuncture, and Betsy didn't think she could get it, so I said, I'll come with you. We got out. And, I mean, the meanest looking dog I've ever seen came straight before us. And just instinctual, I hope every man in the building would have done this, I pushed Betsy behind me and pushed her up against the car. And she was impressed, and I said, well, what would Chris done? <laughs> but, uh, uh, that's just an instinctual thing of protection, isn't it? That, that's just something... That, that, that ought to be uh, inbuilt for, for, for every, any man that's got his worth about him to do. But I want you to see that he says here uh, th that uh, hold fast to what thou hast that no man can take thy crown. So holding fast is protecting it, putting it behind you, not yielding it up, not giving it to anybody. Hold fast. What has God given you? In addition to redemption, surely you understand some truths about the church. Hold on to it. You wake up every day and you face this world one more time. What gives you the ability to do it? Strength given by God. Hold fast to it. Don't give up one thing. Many years ago, uh, and uh, all of the young people, about five of us in here will understand this, uh, before the internet, you had to look up things in encyclopedias when you were writing a paper. And me and Judy were writing papers together, and uh, we needed the same encyclopedia. 
and I hung on for it with everything I had. And Judy was going to get it, and y'all remember how she could be. And so we were pulling and going back and forth, and so finally, I just let go of it. And she flew across the room and hit the wall. But you know, it was funny. But you know who got the work done first? Judy. And you know why? Because I let it go. Right? Don't let it go. We have a wonderful thing here, do we not? The, we, have a, we have the cherished Word of God hold to it. Uh, keep it with everything that you've got. And that's how this church was instructed to do. And if they did it, it says huh, that no man, if you hold to it, no man will take thy crown. We have crowns. You ever thought about it? Just for being in one of the Lord's true churches, a crown, I, that's a wonderful thing. And when we live in the day which we in, when we could go literally anywhere we wanted to and probably be more entertained much so than you'll get here, it's hard sometimes, is it not? But dear friend, with that, with that faithfulness comes a crown. And it ought to be cherished by God's people. It ought to be loved and adored by us. Verse 12. Him that overcometh, that makes it through this, who maintains their crown, who maintains their love, who maintains their compassion, who keeps the door open, him that overcometh, <coughs> will I make a pillar in the temple of my God. Now what is a pillar? A pillar is something that holds up the whole structure. The thing that, uh, a thing that uh, everything uh, rests upon. Whenever uh, we built this building, the guy that laid the block, I made a question and uh, it's in the hands of the Almighty, but I wanted, the, I wanted the building to be raised up to be level with that road. And if you can look at it, that would have been about another eight feet. And he said, we can do it, but it'll take iron beams. And I said, well, how much do they cost? He said, about $800 a piece. And I said, we'll just go with this. <laughs> you see, it made a very easy decision, did it not? But wouldn't it be a good thing in, in the kingdom of the Almighty to be one of those beams? That's what, could you imagine this being eight feet higher off the ground and those beams in there holding it up all the time Never given a little wimp either way. I want to be something like that that God can depend on, don't you? I don't want to ever give up. I don't want to ever want to throw in the town. I, I want to be, I want to be uh, as the old saying goes, one of the last men standing. And he made this problem, I mean, promised to the church at Philadelphia that they would be these type of individuals. And he shall go no more out, and I will write him upon the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which, overcome, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon it my new name. He that have an ear, and once you see the comma there, meaning that's a thought in and of itself, not a complete thought, but a thought. He that have an ear. You know why some people never get it? They don't have an ear. You know why some people get bored and leave? They don't have an ear. You know why some individuals have no response to the gospel? They just don't have these. Now, I have physical ears, but they don't work too good without these things. You see what I'm saying? But, when he was saying that, he said, if you do, if you understand this, listen. If, if, if this is ringing home to you, listen. You know what, dear friend, if you're lost this morning and the gospel rings home to you, you have that spiritual ear, you listen. It's critical. He that have an ear, let him hear what the Spirit, capital S Spirit, Holy Ghost Spirit, Holy Spirit, saith unto the churches. Now, have you ever thought about how many churches are named in the New Testament? Uh, I did a study years ago, and I don't know if Don will remember this, it's we saw it bump us mail, and we're having a vacation Bible school. 
And I wanted to do a study on all the churches in the New Testament. And the best I could find, there's about 87 mentioned. Much, much more beyond the, the church letters. And, uh, and in that, we have one here that's cream of the crop. I find that very intriguing, don't you? And only the Lord knows from the time of the days of the apostles to now, probably literally millions of churches. But you, you, you can't help but wonder how many are like Philadelphia? How many are emitting that love that we are to all people? It's easy to get judgmental, is it not? You know those people that you can think of right now that seem the most vile and wicked that you know? You know what they need? They need the gospel. There's no different than them and you except that the Lord saved you by His mercy and grace. That is the only difference. That's right. And when we grab that, we can go into the cell room of Charles Manson and, let me t and ask him, let me tell you the goodness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because you're no different than he is. We need to be like Philadelphia. We need to love unconditionally. Give the gospel to the first person that will listen to you. 